Now let's stay in Salem. Is it time for Malaya's to me? I know there's one in Ohio. It will it will be our chills, our island of danger. And then we'll head for Salem, New York. There is a Salem there. Alright, so the first thing I wanted to discuss about chapters 14 through 18 are the fact that what uh, the group is actually doing, or what Clara and Elias are actually doing, is they're moving across the United States in like um, a kind of trail or map of the cities of Salem in the United States of America, if that makes sense to you. So they went first to a Salem, Oregon. There's a Salem, Massachusetts. There's a Salem, Ohio. And there's a Salem, New York. So basically what they're doing is they're going on a tour of Salem. So yeah, that's neat. I found that really, really interesting. I didn't know that that's what they were doing, but I kind of guessed it. I was like, Salem, Oregon. Like usually when you hear Salem, you hear Salem, Massachusetts and you know, all the witch trials and stuff like that. That's what you hear about it. But apparently what's really important is the fact that there was a railroad and there was some other stuff going on with Salem and other parts of the country. So yeah, I thought that was really interesting. Another thing that um I really liked was let's see. <sighs> well, there was a, a mention, right? Of like, I just wanted to revisit the relationship and the bonding. Let's call it a bonding. Let's call it a bonding between Clara and Elias. I want to mention that. I walked over to True. I was stuck in some deep mud. This mud did feel soft and warm. Martin will pull out of it, whatever it is. And Martin's her sister, by the way. The thought did not soothe me. Elias stepped out of my arms and frowned. What happened? You look so tired. I'll just leave you two alone. Kirby stepped out of the shack. I gently took hold of Elias's head, squeezing it between my palms. And I, <laughs> I'm sorry, and I slowly took Hold up Elias' head, squeezing it between my palms. We're chasing wind. We're going to a place you can't name in search of something you can't find. It's not real. None of this is real. A light keeper, what is that? You don't know? Either of you? Especially the other one. The one who you call, no, the one who calls me Clarita and wants me to read the stars. That's crazy. This is crazy. And at home, things are happening. Real things. Real things. Okay. I picked that phrase because Salem... Salem to me is like unreal because I mean even though they're getting into where they're traveling to the different Salem's It's still unreal to me because what do you need it for like I don't understand why you need this and what what you know about it So basically where it starts out or where it's ended up for me is that they have a map of the stars that they're kind of tracing So they're, they're looking at things like Orion, Poseidon, they're looking into astrology as well as doing a tour of the cities of Salem it irritates me a little bit because it's like running off on this, going off on a tangent when speaking. Like you see something, oh, shiny things, and you go running off behind it, right? But you don't know like where it's going to lead. It's like the cat, the kid is walking around and he sees a balloon float by and he, he goes behind the balloon and then all of a sudden he's kidnapped. You know what I'm saying? You never see him again. That's how I kind of feel like they're going with this. And like she said, none of this is real, like. What is this? What's going on? Why am I chasing stars with you? Why am I chasing cities of Salem with you? When I could be home doing something really real in my, about my life. My sister is sick. Like, FFA wrote her and told her that Marta was sick and that she needed to get back home. That's something she should be worried about, but she's doing this when there are really real things happening at home. So, yeah. That's one of the things. Like, in life, I, I felt like I was caught in a bubble. One that I didn't want to be in bubble you know it's cloudy but i can still see through and there's some people that will stay in that bubble and kind of just exist and i'm partially that person because it's kind of hard to get out of the funk when you're in it but i'm also that same person that's always wiping the window of the bubble trying to make sure it's not fogged up so i can see out of it because i need to see what's coming from the left and the right and front and the back and sometimes you get blindsided you know you don't always win with that but i'm also the person that's still looking because i don't trust you and i don't trust you and i don't trust that it's something over there you know whatever it is it's something over there and i don't like it so yeah, it's like she's stuck in a bubble with Elias and she's running off um, gallivanting across the country with this kid that special needs and she does not know what she's doing. And he, sub he should be in school. Like, she's basically kidnapping him or they ran away together. She's called his mom, going to be able to let her know, you know, we'll be back. But when are you going to get to it? You know what I'm saying? What are you here for? What is the point of all of this? That's what I've been wondering. 
And then she she's emotionally attached to him. Like she says things like she grabbed the sand, she held the palm of his hands, and she's feeling all you know nostalgic about him or emotional because she he she's okay. He named the plane Clara Clara a light in the sky. That's what he named the plane, the one winged plane that they purchased from the junkyard in Salem, um, Oregon. Yes, in Salem, Oregon, or Salem, Wisconsin, because he did go to Salem, Wisconsin. All right, so yeah, he named her Clara a light in the sky. And she, he's like, she's not quite as pretty as you, but maybe when I'm done with her, she'll, you know, I'd be beautiful or whatever. But he's talking about Clara and reference to being pretty and the plane is in reference to being pretty. And it's kind of, they're emotionally attached and it's irritating for me because I don't like the relationship. Um, and then the way she speaks about him, like, they met this girl or this guy holler at a sweet shop in this town where they stopped to get the airplane. And she's given this really, really, like, amazing analogy about fiction and reality or truth and reality. Like, uh, truth and false. Fiction and reality, okay? She asked the question, um... Have you ever run from reality? Have you ever run because reality was too much, too suffocating, too, just too, too much? And then you find a fiction, something fake or falsehood, and the fiction feels more real than the real ever did. Have you ever felt like that? That's a good analogy. Like, I have felt like that. I felt that the fake thing that I was enjoying so much felt better than the real thing that I hated so much could ever feel, and I would rather stick with the fake than be with the real any day of my life, which kind of, again, keeps you in that bubble. Um, so the guy Holly was like, no, no, I can't say as I have. I do know that fiction, he picked up an empty chocolate wrapper and tossed it into the trash. It eventually becomes a mighty poor substitute for what's real. He popped the last chocolate into his mouth. I really can't say, I really can't stay any longer. I said, off to it, find your fiction. Holly pointed to a picture on the wall, his eyes wistful. A woman, his love, I was sure of it. Sometimes fiction is all you've got, and how long they stay, well, who am I to provide a counsel to reality, a counsel on reality, but what he's saying basically is he's saying that fiction is fiction, reality is reality, and it's not, it's not a good substitution. He's saying that no matter how good something feels in the moment, eventually that person leaves because it's not really real, and the real is still there, uncomfortable, awkward, you know, hurtful, painful. Whatever, sometimes feeling good, sometimes feeling bad, sour and sweet, all at the same time. It's still there, and you still have to deal with it. It's like putting a Band-Aid over something, you know, and then taking it off, and it's still there. And you still have to deal with the reality of the situation. So, yeah, that's what he's saying. I really like that part, because I like the analogy. Because it, it, it feels good to hear somebody else say something that you thought, but not been able to put into words. So, yeah, it's like, oh, my God, if I break up with a guy, and I, I'm hurting so bad, like, I... One time have, not all the time, like delve into a fantasy that is better for me than reality. I can just dream, you know, but who wants to sleep all the time? But for a while, while you're going through that breakup, sleeping and dreaming is better than being awake and hurting and crying and realizing that the person that you really want to be with is not there. You know, you don't want to sit up and cry forever. So what you do is you, you know, live that little fantasy life until you get over it. I hate to be that one that's still crying over the breakup like a week later. Like, I'm so totally past that point in my life because I've been there so much in my life. I think I moved out. I moved out of that city. I burnt it down. I did all of that stuff. But at the same time, like I said, the dream world and your real world is not the same. And being in the dream world will stop you from making money. It will stop you from living. make you fat. make you gain weight. It'll make... Everything around you just collapsed, you know, but I think I went too far with that, but you get what I'm trying to say. Basically, it's the same thing. So, let's see. So, it starts out, she's talking about she just spent her entire night in prison. This is chapter 15, but you know, they have like this. She's in a historic house, Salem, Wisconsin, so she's sleeping in like some kind of tourist attraction. I slammed and shut the door to the sweet shop at start and stared at Holler. He took off his glasses and set them on the counter. So that's where you went. It's a rough old jailhouse. He shook his head. Your crime must have been heinous, right? Okay, so she spent night in the old jailhouse. I squinted shielding sunlight with my hand. Which crime? The long ago one? The best friend one? The sister one? What if she doesn't recover? How could I lose another? And then it's the Elias issue. 
All right, so that's talking about the jail, which I thought was interesting that she was able to do that. I'm not sure about all your offenses, but I know I do know even prisoners get hungry and thirsty. And so he offers her some food or whatever, which is not that bad. Um, Alright, so Londoners, this is basically I'm talking about where she's from and her remembering she has a life that so she has to get back to at the junkyard with the guy. Kirby, who she bought the plane from, or they bought the plane from. So, when she gets back, uh, Mr. Kirby and Elias were back there building it. You know, he had a couple of his family members help them move it because Clara wasn't there to help out. And then there's the part that I like, but kind of dislike because I don't really like the character Izzy. The introduction of the character Izzy is in Chapter 17, I think. Chapter 16. So, she falls asleep with um, Elias at uh, a gun range where a holler had told her about somewhere where they could camp out for the night or sleep or whatever. And she wakes up to a gun being pointed in her face. So, this is both of me, chapter, one, um, chapter 16, page 143. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm reading, I'm reading, I'm reading, I'm reading. Okay. I woke with the barrel of a gun. Excuse me, it's page 141. I woke with the barrel of a gun inches from my nose. My breath caught and I slowly reached over to pinch Elias. Let him sleep. The gun tapped my fingers and I drew them back. Ever killed anybody, Clara? So let him sleep was uh, Izzy. She hasn't introduced herself yet, but that's Izzy telling him, don't tell her, don't wake him up. Against the moonlight stars, the frame and voice hinted girl. So it's definitely a girl. But the gun in the question didn't fit. I shook my head. She gazed at me. But you're running, right? You and him, you're running from something big. Maybe something you did. Maybe something he did. Uh, do I know you? That's what she said. Is it money you're after? Perhaps I can help. Get out. She cleared her throat and glanced about. We need to walk. So, a minute later, I was chugging through thick undergrowth. A girl with a gun step, stepping at my side. You knew my name, I said. You left your car door open. That's stupid number one around here. Stupid number two was not reading the signs. Range closed 8 p.m. Still have, here after that? Cliff authorizes me to plug you with a bullet. Let's just say bullet because I don't know what's coming next and that is it. <clears throat> it's been some time since I pulled a trigger, but don't think I'm rusty. So, anyway, I'm just going to start right here because I don't want to get too carried away with this reading or whatever. But Izzy is, like, rough around the edges. When I read about her character and the description of her, like, I picture, like, some 13, 14-year-old kid, you know, dirty tank top, blue jeans, shorts, dirty sneakers, ponytail and hair ragged type of chick with a BB gun or something because she is holding a gun. Like, leading, like <laughs> attempting to be hard, attempting to be bullied attempted to be a bully in this situation so that's the kind of girl that I, I picture here um she nudged on me with the barrel the deeper we crunched until there was no sign of the sky and the path disappeared beneath our feet thick silence surrounded breath and cracker branches breath in the cracker branches that's all there was and then as we broke into a clearing sound returned the licking tongues of flickering fire fronting the silhouette of a small cabin standing just beyond Crickets chirped and water bubbled, and my captor motioned me toward a long, a log beside the blaze. Okay, so think. Clara's thinking. She's like, okay, we're going to fight because I don't know what she wants to do with me. She's going to try to kill me or what? She's like, you've been in scrapes before. Like, what do you do? Um, my mind woke up. What's your name then? So she's now, now at this point, she's trying to engage her in conversation. She's trying to see what happened, what's going to happen. So she's trying to either fill her out. Or calm her down. So I'm not sure which. So she introduces herself. She's like, I'm Izzy, short for Lizzie, short for Isabel, short for Isabel IV. Though if you call me anything but Izzy, and she hesitates, I'll shoot you. <laughs> so yeah. Anyway, so the more I read this, uh, Izzy is trying to introduce herself to Kira. 
they end up arguing a little bit because she's asking a lot of questions about Elias and where they're headed, where they're going, why they're leaving. Basically, she wants to tag along. She asks when she asks can she tag along, and her and Kira get into uh, like I said, they finish the argument. Kira runs off trying to escape Izzy in the gun. She gets back to the car. Elias is in the front seat, and Izzy is in the back seat. So she beat her there, and. Elias thinks that she's a guard for them and that they should take her on the trip and he's all gonna hope for that So they wind up taking her even though uh, Clara tries to get her out of the car I don't know if I got it here, but Clara tries to get her out of the car So they're making their way to Salem, New York. I believe it is they're on the road trip and she's like if I drive 40 miles an hour Maybe I'll irritate her into getting out of the car, but They get to the toll booth and she tries to make her pay for the toll and she winds up attempting to pull a gun on the toll with the operator so that doesn't work all right so but anyway um so yeah he, he's he, he's feeling like this is elias and he's feeling like clara is his guide and izzy is his guard <clears throat> he's saying that of course he sketched this because sometimes he has psychic visions and he sketches them out he Izzy and Clara. He sketched a sketch of that and she found that amazing. Okay, they're in, they're on road trip into Chicago, chapter 17. And let's see, it was another one here that I wanted to talk about. Okay. Well then, so this is after they've been on the road trip and they're coming through Chicago. They've argued a lot about the speed of the car, and Elias came up with the solution that Izzy should not Izzy, but Clara should drive forty miles an hour for to ease her comfort in the situation. And to ease Izzy's comfort in the situation, he wants her to drive, you know, double that. I don't know. He wants her to drive slow for her and fast for Izzy. He's trying to make a compromising situation. So he's like, maybe we should drive slow for an hour and fast for an hour. So Clara pulls off the road and she's like, it doesn't seem as though it, there's a need for me on this trip. It appears you have found not only an able guard but a suitable guy. Like, she can do both jobs. She is delusional. She is accommodating. She is attractive. What more could you want? This is uh, Clara talking to Elias. I stepped out of the car and opened the rear door, dropping the keys into Izzy's hand. This trip is yours. You win. Win what? Oh, shut it. It has some quiet clear sense. You stuck your weapon in my face that the only thing you wanted was him. I pointed into the front seat at Elias. Well, here he is. Why you want him, I don't know. I reached over her lap and grabbed my bag. I yanked and walked away from the car before plunking down on the shoulder and burying my head. The car revved and pulled out. So Izzy actually drove off. Curious. I listened as it disappeared into the distance and a strange way of empty that uh, Elias shows up. He's like, you abandoned us. You know, and then they start arguing about that. And he was like, this was my journey. I would not break my word again. And that means that they're not going to let anybody come between them again. And they walk off together trying to find their vehicle. All right, and he couldn't even remember why there was an airplane attached to the car. This is what I want to tell you guys. Uh, Clara talked Elias into going off his medication, trying to get him to slip through his consciousness to the point where he was the other guy, the more offensive one, because she wants to see what happens and if she can solve the problem for him that is his medical issue. So I found that really reckless. I, I found that irresponsible because what she's trying to do is make him go off meds and get sick so she can find the light keeper, which is the, the hold of his destiny, basically the person that can answer the questions for him that's going to ease his mind and get him out of the split personality, personality zone that he is in. So at this point during this trip, he acts a little differently. He's a little bit more aggressive or a little bit more straightforward because he is off his medication. So yeah. Anyway, um, that was pretty much chapters 14 through to the point of chapter 18 because I did not read chapter 18. Um, 
uh, my thoughts on this, Clara needs to let Elias go back on his medication. They need to really sit down and have a conversation with Izzy and see what her motives are because she carries a gun. She's just going to get them shot by the cops or she's going to shoot someone and she's dangerous. They need to set a clear destination to where they're going and how they're going to get back instead of all of these trips to Salem here, Salem there, Salem here, Salem there because... I mean, even though that's fun because it's all road tripping or whatever, it's dangerous with, with somebody with medications and stuff like that. And they need to check in with Guinevere. So, that's pretty much where I am with this subject. They bought the airplane, so I'm assuming they're going to head back home soon because they had a hitch to a trailer hooked to the car. Um, but other than that, these were pretty good chapters. No, nothing really exciting happened except for the part about Izzy um, attacking Claire with a gun. And, yeah. So, if you guys have anything or any uh, anything to say... Anything to share about chapters 14 through 18, please feel free to leave a written response or a video response uh, telling me about your view of the book um, below in the comment section. Also, join me next. After we finish this, we're going to be reading Mr. Topic. It is by Charles Elton. If you have any suggestions on books that we can read, you can also leave those below. And yeah, guys, that's pretty much it. Thanks for watching.